an angle that I took on it was reflecting on my own experiences. I was quite interested in the question, who is poor? So who are we talking about when we raise concerns about barriers to accessing or engaging in theatre? Do we simply mean the most disadvantaged in society, or should we be concerned with a much wider demographic than that? I'm going to briefly talk through the work that I've been involved in, so it should only be 10 minutes, just saying about that, why I did it, and how these experiences led me to pose that question. Um, I'm not an academic, so it's more just a summary of my own experiences as a playwright and as a theatre maker. So what are my objectives starting off, you know, working in the theatre? Well, as a theatre maker, I want to break into the professional theatre, which means being paid good rates for my work and working with paid professionals. But I'm also interested in theatre that's popular. So maybe that means not just in the grand traditional theatres, maybe it means not just you want to see a pantomime and some other form, more regular forms of, of theatre that people could be popularly engaged in. Uh, I also want to make political theatre, so I am interested in the tradition of political theatre, and theatre is not just about issues, but which directly looks towards to contribute some form of change in society. So these are things, you know, I'm asking myself, can I do these things? Are they, are they possible to have at once? So I set up a project, um, it was influenced by the work of Joan Littlewood and Ian McCall in Manchester in the 1930s, when obviously they set up a, uh, a series of theatre companies which eventually became Theatre Workshop. But one of the things I was interested in, which they did, was called Newsboy, and it was an agitprop piece um, about a street news seller who uh, encounters different injustices for these on the streets. He initially symbolises the uh, right-wing press and the views that they hold, and but through experiencing injustices on the streets, he changes radically and becomes um, a seller of the daily worker, so he converts in that way. I was interested in this agitprop piece, and I thought I would expand it into a different, a different project, which is which I called Newsboy, and that's just the graphic there. It was a new living newspaper composed of short scripts addressing current political issues, but it kept the character of the 1930s newsboy who shouts out the headlines and links together the different scripts, which are um, written by different playwrights about different issues. It was script in hand, which means the actors have the script like this and they read from, from the paper. So it's somewhere between a reading and a, and a, and a fully produced work. But it's, I found quite an interesting way of of playing with that and perhaps adding a few props in and creating something which is quite quite interesting as a show. But also it, it saves you on time in terms of you don't have to rehearse as much because the actors have it in front of, in front of them. Sorry. Um, also, we had no funding, so that's obviously a major part of it. But we did manage to use professional actors, although on an unpaid basis. It was small scale, mainly 50 seater theatre venues. I co-produced uh, three shows in an established mainstream theatre in Glasgow. And then I produced and directed further shows at the Edinburgh Festival of Politics, which was inside the Scottish Parliament, and in a nightclub space as well. So I look at this project and sort of start asking some of the questions about what were the positives, what were the negatives. So there were three successful shows within the mainstream theatre, which had positive reviews. There was a platform for political views and freedom of expression, so different writers could say different things about different issues. There was also a platform for experimentation, for example, the value of agitprop. Well, some people would try agitprop pieces, you would have naturalistic pieces, you might have a poem, you have a different variety within, within the show. It was done in an egalitarian spirit, so it was combining the experienced and less experienced playwrights, <coughs> and it was giving those writers a bit of ac accessibility for perhaps possibly their work being seen by the, by the professional theatre, possibly um, access to actors to, which helps them develop their work because they get that access, which can be quite difficult to get sometimes as you're a, a developing writer. So then I'm asking myself afterwards, what, what are the challenges? You know, what are the perils of doing it yourself like this? Well, can you afford to work for free? That comes out as a big question, which is what I'm hearing in this conference a lot from, the, from different places, obviously. And that was my experience as well. Ca if you can afford to work for free, your time is still precious, so you have to think about what you can do and what you can't do. Admin, admin, and more admin. There's always lots of admin involved. And there's a lot of work involved in creating theatre, which you realise when you do it, which is not really what you might call directly creative. It's not the playwright necessarily, the acting or the, or the directing. But all the work you need to do with promotion and marketing and setting up your venue and all these things you might need to do just to allow the stage where that can then, where the creative can then happen. And that's really valuable work. But as was said, I think, by Reese at the beginning, it is really interesting this idea of being able to quantify that and, and take it seriously, that that does need to happen if you're going to be able to 
to make here. Um, and cost generally, just breaking even was a big success. Uh, I suppose probably if you're, if you're setting up a fiat company or you're running a full fiat company and you maybe break even but you paid everybody, you probably think that's quite a good thing. But this project particularly was, was struggling to just to break even but didn't pay the actors. So that was something which is a question. It was a fun one off gig for professional actors and they really enjoyed it and you, you, you're relying on a, a reserve of goodwill really where they really want to go turn up and do it. But one of the questions <coughs> afterwards is, well, can you, can you actually ask actors on an unpaid basis to sort of develop a project and take it maybe, a, you know, develop more of a permanent basis, maybe forming a more permanent company? So that is a question that you're asking. But these are all questions, but one of the big questions for me was about the audience. And I was saying, looking at it and thinking, well, the events were quite well publicized and that's the first few shows from an established theater, as I say, and the ticket sales were a real challenge. So why were people not coming? So some of the questions I'm asking is, the marketing, marketing was directly about the political and the austerity nature of the project. Um, were people not interested in political theater? But why, when austerity is affecting the majority of people? I mean, it probably does affect most people in some way. So I looked at the demographic of the people who did come and they really enjoyed the shows. We attracted students, theater makers, and friends of theater makers mainly, mainly not the general public. So I'm asking myself, well, where, where are the people, if you like? Theatre does work with disadvantaged groups, and they have lots about that, and that's all really valuable work. But we also, but we also have forum theatre, which I am really interested in. It's definitely political. I'm not sure if there's a role for professional actors, maybe. I'm not sure if there's a role for a playwright. Is it popular? I'm not, I don't know. Maybe it is. I don't think it is at the moment. It could be, but these are the things I'm thinking about. There's theatre for the better off, arguably, the RSC or, or whatever you want to say, the, the ballet. I'm not saying that should be the case, but and in, like somebody said in one of the discussions, it's not just about the ticket prices. It's, it's some kind of invisible barriers, perhaps, to people going to that. But I'm asking about, well, what, what's, the wider, what's the wider group? And is it the working class? Can we call it the working class, maybe? And I'm talking really about people are not materially poor. So people maybe they work in an office and earn maybe 20,000 be people earning less than that, they can be earning minimum wage or people earning more than that. But there seems to be a lot of people who do, do actually have some disposable income and they can actually afford to pay for things. So they go to the cinema, they go to sport, they go to gigs, they go to, and they maybe go to a pantomime or musical occasionally. But generally, that leads me to ask myself, well, what, well could a section of society in a culturary sense be deprived of the cultural good of the theatre? Now that's obviously assuming that the theatre is a cultural good of some kind which you would have to have a debate about and maybe argue for why, because maybe you'd have to convince people, why, you, why should I come to this and not just go to the cinema? What's the difference? What's it for? But, but assuming that we, most of us, probably think that it is a good for people, then might they be in some way culturally poor if they're not accessing it because they're not getting that experience? So I always ask myself these type of questions, and I um, thought to myself, if we want to make the theatre for a wider public, or the working class, as they're called that, maybe we are thinking about popular theatre, maybe we are. However, how can we continue exploring questions raised by projects like Newsboy around how to have professional, popular, and political theatre at the same time? So I applied for some funding to take forward a project to explore a touring theatre approach based on Newsboy in parks and pubs and public spaces, things like this. Unfortunately, it was declined. Interestingly, on the basis the commissioners thought that currently the public do access the theatre in a big way. So that I, I kind of had to disagree with that a little bit. But following Newsboy, I did some further work with trade unions. Um, I was uh, interested with um, the People's Assembly movement in Scotland, so I got a bit involved with them. We had some initial meetings, and it, that's unfortunately since faltered. Um, mainly, I feel, due to the considerable amount of admin time needed, uh, the need to build up new skills and art strategy from a trade union perspective. And specifically in Scotland, we have the post-independence referendum context, whereby a lot of politically motivated artists are already engaged in pro-independence campaigns. So that's not necessarily a barrier to, to, to projects, but it's, 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 it's an, extra, an extra issue. Um, I am hoping to find a way forward with that project in, in the near future. Another couple of things that I'd suggest is that there's maybe a need to build alternative infrastructures of funding that are permanent. And there's things like crowdfunding have been explored. And that's not to say that the mainstream funding is not useful and good, but maybe there are other ways that we could start thinking about how, how, we, could, how we could do that. Um, 
and possibly shifting the discourse, maybe move to major theatres, maybe they need to take more responsibility. Obviously, we heard a lot about theatres taking a lot of responsibility, so sometimes that happens, but maybe not always. Um, and maybe sharing it, sharing it with, with up-and-coming theatre makers and grassroots theatre makers. So I'm just finishing the presentation with that quote from Ian McCall, which I think is quite a strong um, statement about the value of, of political theatre. And he's been a big inspiration for me as a playwright, um, and I'm currently writing a play about him as well. Um, so I think that, you know, the thing to me is, I think if we can imagine on the stage different ways of doing things, we can imagine better society on the stage in some way. That gives you a chance, it gives you a chance of imagining it outside in, in actual society. And I think that that's, that that's kind of, to me, the value of making and making political theatre going forward. That's the end of the presentation, so if you have any questions you want to email me, that's my email address. I think it's all going onto the onto the website. So thanks, thanks very, very much. much.